Rolling. you've come to love and appreciate tonight on the catch the sky podcast clay villanueva someone who's been persecuted because of their religious beliefs a man of god a minister a man of spirituality will be joining us and tell us about his story related to the persecution of these united states government against him well did you say catch this guy <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm in the middle of a lot of legal issues and uh, kind of Sounded interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's an intriguing hour on the Catch the Sky podcast. We hope you'll join in. As you know, we're on social media. And if you'd like to say something, be our guest. We're on all the platforms, although I don't want to be on those platforms. As always, it's safe and sweet tea. And Clay, welcome. Thank you. Did you like that intro better? <laughs> <laughs> what was that third time's a charm right aye, aye, aye. sometimes just getting the conversation started is the hard part and we're so thankful to have you here to share your story and yeah i mean that and and just to give our listeners a preview of what's going to be coming in this uh in this conversation i mean you at one point clay said there, there was a raid there was a dea raid that you know, culminated in your arrest correct uh yes yeah and it that's, was, yeah that doesn't happen to everybody every day hopefully not yes. no so yeah no i definitely uh, we'll we'll get into that more of that later but um thank you for coming on and if any of our listeners want to interact with us they may do so on twitter or instagram facebook youtube wherever by searching for the catch the sky podcast clay do you want to you have a social media handle you want to plug Actually, not at this time due to <laughs> all the legal proceedings. No, yeah, no. <laughs> makes hopefully, sense, right? Hopefully, after all this is done, we'll be completely. You probably have a non disclosure or non sequitur or something like this. Is it a non sequitur? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. Okay, okay. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but, Clay, thank you for joining us. Um, would you, I guess, start from, start from the top? Let's give our listeners a little bit of background into maybe what ayahuasca is for people that don't know and then maybe how you got involved in it is that a good place to start uh sure as good as any <laughs> right so ayahuasca it's been around for known uh, approximately the past four to five thousand years um it's a plant-based referred to as a medicine but obviously here in north america and all the medical stuff it's you know can't actually be called a medicine it's a plant plant-based healing tool. And it is, uh, like I said, something that's been going on for about 5,000 years. It has been helping mankind and everyone has their own experience of it. And there are many different interpretations of exactly what it is and how to best utilize it and how to serve your fellow man with it. So I can't just give you one thing and that'll be correct that no one will uh, have agreement or not but basically my personal experience um, has been that ayahuasca it opens up channels so most every human being that I've spoken with acknowledge even if we don't know what it is that there is something more going on than just the physical world um, whether it's dreams you've had or near-death experience, or, you know, great fear, great love, or, you know, whatever. But most everybody, with the exception of maybe some, some really young people who haven't had a chance yet, but most everybody I've talked to is aware that there's something else going on than just this. And ayahuasca, uh, it deals with that something else. It is, you know, I mean, 
tons of religions are in the world and basically they're kind of structures and frameworks trying to describe what is going on in the non-physical world. Some people just more you generally known as being spiritual. They have their own interpretation. Um, you know, the human race, there's what more than 7 billion of us. So there's probably 7 billion different possible conversations about, about the non-material. But my experience is that our, our material world is actually a very small component in everything that's going on in the universe. Um, I mean, small to the like degree of one grain of sand in the entire Sahara Desert of possibilities and dimensions and, and things that are out in the universe. So I mean, less than that, right? <laughs> or more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So as we're here in the, in the material world dealing with our humanity, I don't know anybody that just gets it when they show up and they're, you know, no, no issue, no problem. They understand everything. And like, I mean, that's kind of personally, I don't think that's why we're here. I think we're here to learn and we're here to have actual experience and whatnot. So every human being has a lesson or many, um, that they're, that they're in, in the middle of. And lots of times the established, uh, repositories of, of information don't have answers and and satisfactory solutions to issues and things that people are going through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people turn to medicine, they turn to religion, they turn to their families. And, you know, I mean, and generally those are all sources of, of, of traditional solutions, but everyone has their own personal growth and their own personal struggles. And, you know, every single person, doesn't matter who you see and how well off they look and they may, you know, own the world, everyone still has their issues. And those issues, often it's hard to address them strictly looking from a physical perspective. What my experience of, of ayahuasca is and does is it actually opens you up to be able to keep one foot in the material world, yet at the same time to be able to see and feel and experience and actually be a channel for information and wisdom from all that is the non-material world. And generally, even with religion and spirituality, the, the theme is that we as human beings are more than just our physical meat, you know, that we're here. And we all have some kind of uh, divine spark or source that comes from someplace that's the non-material world. And it comes here. And then we do this material thing for a brief amount of time. And we learn our lessons, we have our families, and, you know, we, we go through the process. And everyone, that I know of anyway, then has a termination to your short visit on Earth, and we go on to whatever's next. And again, the majority of most religions and spirituality is that you go on to something else. It's not just you're done and let the worms take over, you know, kind of a thing. So um, ayahuasca, aya means soul, and wasca uh, is a catchall word that means vine. So it, it, it translates to the vine of the soul. And basically what it does is it just allows you to, like I said, fully connect with and derive information from the non-material world. And, and when you can actually depart from the material world for even a short period of time, it gives you the freedom to really look at how you are being human but without judgment, you know, here being a human being, it's so easy for us to, to judge ourselves. You know, I did that and oh, it was terrible or, oh, that was okay. Or, or to judge our fellow man. Cause you know, our, our minds, our brains are designed sort of like navigational devices for this dimension, but they are very limited compared to the enormity of the human soul and what's going on in the non-material world. So for a lot of the issues that I've found that people have, in their humanity, their struggles and desires, and I mean, just anything any human being could ever be uh, facing, it is a huge benefit to be able to see yourself being human from a very unbiased yet spiritual perspective. So things that have been troubling you for a long time that you just couldn't get answers to from traditional sources or even from your own thinking 
lots of times, you know, like one and one just does not equal two on all dimensions. I mean, it's a cool thing for here on earth, but you know, you're like, Hey, I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And the, the outcome is not, it's just not working. And I'm asking everybody around me and they're like, no, just it's a one, two, three. And we do it. And some people struggle with items for years. It can be physical issues. It can be relationship issues. It can be, you know, deep emotional traumas, things that just are not working out from a linear perspective. When you can actually take a little break from your humanity and fly around kind of in the un or the non-material world from an unbiased point of view and see yourself from a complete third person loving perspective, then you can clearly, clearly see how we are blocking our own growth, our own energies, our own love and fulfillment. And when you actually clearly see yourself doing whatever it is that you're doing, that's causing you to have a particular issue in your life, regardless of physical, mental, spiritual, or relationship, no one needs to convince you uh, that you need to do something different. I mean, it is, it is clear because it's you seeing you. It's not about taking this pill. It's not about trying this other program. It's not about like you really should, like, like you know in your heart, you know, when you see yourself shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak, in a particular situation, and then it becomes crystal clear to you, oh my God, it, oh, now I see exactly what I'm doing. No one needs to convince you to do something different because what you really want, you've been wanting for a really long time and there's been no solution. And now you clearly see what is going on and the action. That's why I believe ayahuasca is so powerful because it doesn't tell you what to do. And, it, and it's not about, you know, right or wrong or the rules. It's you looking at you. It's, it, it's like if you could zoom out and see yourself as a child crawling towards the edge of a swimming pool and about to fall in, like nobody needs to tell you that you need to go and pull this child away so they're not going to fall in the pool and drown. But just from a mental perspective, if you're the child, you know, you're like, well, what's this? Oh, that water looks kind of cool. And next thing you know, there's this whole big, uh, big traumatic event and, you know, nobody really knows why. And next thing you know, you could be uh, traumatized for the rest of your life because you fell in and almost drowned. So to be able to see that perspective clearly, I think, is the deepest underlying uh, value of ayahuasca and how it allows people to make such drastic changes in their life because it's them choosing for their own benefit because they clearly have seen how what they're doing is not serving them and how they could do something different that would serve them and their families and their loved ones enormously. And so how did you come to be introduced to ayahuasca? Cause obviously this isn't something that, you know, everybody, this isn't something that everybody knows about. Obviously, you know, you don't, is there an ayahuasca store that we can go to? Can you smoke ayahuasca? <laughs> I don't think they've opened the store yet, and I've never heard of anybody uh, smoking or vaping uh, right. ayahuasca. Actually, my introduction to it is it's uh, pretty bizarre. Um, I was doing volunteer. We like bizarre. Oh, well, good. Awesome. <laughs> I guess that's why I'm here. Perfect. So in uh, 1992, I believe, three, something like that. I don't know. I'm old. I was doing volunteer work in Loma Linda, California at the uh, Loma Linda University uh, uh, Children's Hospital nearby uh, with this um, amazing uh, doctor, Dave Warner. And uh, he had this place called the Center for Really Neat Research. And it was all about brilliant technology folks applying their talents and skills to be able to help um, children, often uh, quadriplegics and, and kids that were really, really in a bad way because the children's hospital, you know, was right there and that, that was the, the best place to, to be able to, to serve. And uh, the issue at the time was that the insurance companies only do like the, the absolute minimum and it's only like just whatever they need, surgery or life-saving or whatever. But as far as quality of life goes, nobody was addressing that. And right. these, these poor kids were like locked in their bodies, you know. Mm -hmm. So there were some amazing engineers. I mean, there were like guys that, that were working on virtual reality projects where they would put um, 
sensors on the kid's face. And as the kid blinked their eyes or moved or winked or smiled, they could control vehicles in, in 3D virtual reality and, and fly through space. Um, these guys uh, uh, hooked up remote control little uh, RV vehicles with uh, cameras on them. And then the kids uh, from their from their beds, quadriplegic, could w w uh, we could put a, a television monitor in front of them, and then they could drive this vehicle that was outdoors with a camera by by just expressions on their face. And so you know they could make different faces and it would go forward and back and play with dogs mm -hmm. and go up on tree. I mean it was like really amazing stuff. So yeah, um, so that was like really spoke to me. And there were, you know there was no pay involved, but just the quality of life of being able to to, to bring this to kids that were really depressed and you know about their, their their situation spoke to me yeah so I, w I was working there i was doing sound uh work and research i had a little project of my own and then while i was there this guy um just hands me a little baggie of brown powder and he said you know i don't even know what this is but a friend of timothy leary's gave this to me and i've <laughs> held on to it for a while and something is just screaming at me that you need to have it and i was like um okay and he didn't even know what it was. And I looked at it and there was this little white tag in there and it said ayahuasca and it had, you know, the chemical breakdown of it and whatnot, but it didn't really have any directions. You know, I didn't you snort it, smoke it. Like, I didn't yeah, know yeah precisely. Yeah, like, that's always my first question. What, what, what do you is do with this? this? You know, I mean, and in 92, like there wasn't even Google or it was just, you know, so I was like, Oh, great. Well, thank you. And then I, I concluded my, my, my work at that place, but I kept this, this baggie of brown powder. So I moved a few times. I still had the baggie. I moved from California to Arizona in 1997. Still had it. I just, um, yeah, I just love that it's coming with you the whole time. It's, <laughs> it's just not going anywhere. Just something was like, just, you need this, dude. And so um, in uh, 2010, I think it was, maybe 2011, um, I turned 50. And I was going through some stuff. And I found this baggie. And it's like 18 years I've been holding on to this baggie <laughs> with this bizarre energy. And I mean, I ask everybody, everybody I know that anything can even spell psychedelics or any, I mean, every hippie, any, anything, like does anybody know what ayahuasca is? And they're like, Aya what? Anyway, so I turned 50, I found this baggie. I'm like, what is, hey, we've got Google. Google yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody has heard of this obscure thing. I'm sure in the corner somewhere, somebody at least will acknowledge it. So I go, you know, Google A Y A H U A. As soon as I hit enter, it was like, boom, whoa, it, holy cow. Yeah, I mean, I was just, I couldn't believe it. For the next two days, it just leave me alone. Don't talk to me. I was just buried in every single web page, video. I mean, it was, I had missed the boat. I mean, the whole entire world knew about ayahuasca except for me. And um, uh, when I saw that, vine of the soul i was like hey you know at 50 i thought i was kind of over the hill so i need to do this like quick um, <laughs> so within a week i had talked to my wife and i sold a car so that i could buy a plane ticket and go down to peru and i searched for different uh places where they were doing this these uh these ayahuasca centers and i found one that spoke to me and they were like sure we have availability come on down and uh yeah they sure did so i got down there and uh, they had like 10 or 12 people booked for september it just passed and they had another 10 or 12 people booked for November, which was coming up and October. There was one name on the board and that was me. So I was the only person there except for the help. And I was like, all right. And this place was so deep in the jungle. I mean, we flew into uh, Lima, Peru. And then from there we flew to a place called Iquitos, Peru. And that place is an Island city with no roads to it at all. You can only get there by boat or airplane. And then from this place in the middle of the jungle, then we uh, took little motorcycles and went out another 45 minutes deep into the jungle. And I was pretty much, no one will ever find me ever. This could be the end. Mm. Um, so one thing leads to another, I get all settled in, we're there, we go to the first night of ceremony and this uh, pretty wild dude, all in his get up and feathers in his head. And you know, he's, we're doing an ayahuasca ceremony and it was me and the owners and a couple of the help, and that was it. They poured this big fat cup of brown thick liquid that kind of tasted like suede. And uh, he hands it to me and I was like, all right, well, I love you guys and uh, we'll see how this works out. And I drank it and man, 45 minutes later, 
the roof blew off the place and <laughs> the universe was this brilliant sparkling i mean i was in a whole other dimension though i knew i was here and let me tell you the spirit of the madre which is ayahuasca came and stared at me and said welcome home and i knew i was back from where i came from as a human being and from that moment on life has never been the same i was uh i was at that place 10 days and we did uh, four ayahuasca ceremonies and um yeah it was a pretty emotional deal on the second night uh everybody pretty much goes to bed around 11 o'clock and then i was in there just fully in it all this stuff and i was getting these downloads from the ayahuasca and everybody had gone to bed and then it was it was talking to me it was telling me these things and it was about you know go up to the shaman's table and 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 go to where his instruments are and i was like what i'm not so anyways all right so i went up and it said grab the harmonica i'm like i can't even spell harmonica you know and they're like grab the harmonica so i did that and i started playing and all these colors were coming out of the harmonica and this song that the shaman had just played started happening i have no idea how that worked it was just this magical flow of information through ayahuasca and through my body and then it said pick up the the shaker the the uh, the maracas you know the ch -ch 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 things and it was teaching me about how, how that uh, transfers energies and it said okay now spin it around and as i spun it around i started getting nauseous and i was about to purge mm -hmm. uh and they said okay so that's how that works and then it said shake it and as i shook it lights were shooting out of the the, the maracas and, it, and it, it's like you could you could think and feel these energies with your heart and as you shook them the, the maracas these energies would come out as you were, were choosing they were like like spray nozzles of your of your soul energy and then it was telling me to go around and play the harmonica and and shake the uh, in the spots where the people were sitting who had been in the ceremonies. And it, as I looked around where everybody was sitting, it was still glowing with their energies, even though they had, they had gone to bed. And it was telling me to, um, to go and play and, and really project my, 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 the love in my soul towards these people. So I'm going around and I'm playing this harmonica and I'm doing this thing and that's going on for like, I don't even know, an hour and a half. And that was, uh, Pretty crazy and then it told me to go sit in front of where the shaman was sitting because that was really glowing brightly and i did and all this information just started downloading into me and i was i mean i just it was like being on the information super highway of cosmic stuff and i thought that was pretty amazing and then it said now go sit on it and it was like being on old faithful geyser i mean this stuff was just shooting through my body and it was this whole lesson in, in plants and energy and how the plants uh, spirits uh, communicate with people and and how they've been here for millions of years and you know and they're on these other frequencies and they really have this deep desire to help the human race and it was just more information than i ever imagined possible and then it said to cover myself with this white silk cloth that he had used and then i was kind of in this egg cocoon thing and then that went on for like almost an hour and that was like the most intense downloading experience i can ever imagine it was it was crazy it's and like then the, the next matrix matrix oh yeah exactly right yeah but the good matrix actually mm -hmm. um so yeah and then uh every morning we'd have a little round circle thing about how your ceremony went the, the night before and uh you know everyone who had been there were like yeah we had this and i had this vision and they would kind of translate what that meant and, and then um and then they they got to me and they said so how was your evening and i was like well <laughs> it was uh pretty stunningly phenomenal and i went into detail describing what happened and the owners were like oh my goodness you touched the shaman's stuff and i was like well i didn't really know i wasn't supposed to and the shamans over there laughing and um and so i described this whole process to them and, they were, and the other people that went to bed they said oh we thought the shaman came back and was holding part two of the ceremony but you know maybe it was optional because they didn't tell us about it and i said no I'm, I'm sorry if i did something wrong but i mean that was you know i was i was clearly told that that's uh, what i needed to be doing <laughs> so that was like the second night and then on the third night as we're in ceremony and the exact same thing's happening and we're i'm flying through these different dimensions and i'm learning all this stuff i decided that i really wanted to send a powerful message back to the united states to my wife and so i'm i'm lying back 
And I just imagine this magnificent, beautiful ball of, of sunshine energy coming out of my heart and coming out of my whole body and my soul and then lifting up above me. And I just filled it with all the beauty that I could possibly imagine. And then I sent it up, up in the sky, up to the stars, and then saw it coming back down in Phoenix, Arizona, where I was from, and that it would encompass her and she would, she would feel it and feel the love. And that was kind of my little, I love you thing. The next morning we had uh, our circle again to talk about the ceremony and, uh, and they got back to me and they asked about the night. And of course I, I went through the, the whole thing and I was, as I was describing what I did by sending this energy ball to my wife, the person who was sitting next to me said, that's what was going on with that disco ball coming out of your chest last night. So it was very, <laughs> I was like, you saw that? And she's like, oh my God, it was clear as day. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was just tripping. So, so yeah, so there was a whole thing with like shared visions and I mean, direct communication and not even like kind of, sort of, maybe I think I got a clue. I mean, I was like. It's like you can see energy and, and sound. Oh yeah. And the vibrate. Yeah. It was yeah, like yeah. you were describing like seeing like the vibrate when you're talking about the harmonica and then the, the maracas, like it was like you were seeing the vibrations come off of these things almost in addition to all, like, like I said, like you were describing the glowing energy and stuff and then they were able to see it as well. So that's, yeah, that's wild. That was uh, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. And then, I should say something there just so the audience knows I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I could have been in my own world, my own universe. I'm still eager to try some. I think I just want to be in the most comfortable setting possible. I'm very nervous about this potential because I'm, I'm really afraid of what I'll see. My God, am I afraid? And I don't know why, because I think I'll end up just quitting my job. I think that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> so, what made you, what inspired you to bring this here? Cause you obviously, I mean, let's, what, 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 what happened next? I guess you, you came back well, at some point I, <laughs> cause you're here, right? <laughs> yes. And how I, did you I, feel after as well? All right. Well, so the owners and the shaman had had some conversation and then they called me to the side one day and they were like, so, um, you know, we've had, eight or 900 people through here. And we just have never had anything like that happen that happened to you with the whole being called and playing and stuff like that. So, you know, there is no exact translation into what things mean, but we got to tell you, that's not a normal thing. And we really believe strongly that you need to look deeper into this. So uh, they had put together like a little mini shaman kit mm -hmm. and they gave me some training on the spot you know <clears throat> that day and uh kind of explained a bunch of stuff and how to how to work with plants and um shakers and harmonica i mean a whole a whole kit and um i said well that's awesome but i have a job and i have, <laughs> <laughs> I have a house and i, pay, I have a I pay son taxes. <laughs> you know it's like i would love to just come and be jungle boy for the next you know three years and go into training but i have this whole life I've kind of got going on and they were like don't overthink it and just just know there's been a more than substantial communication about you and this work like this was not a user experience this was you've done something and this triggered and opened up and you need to be looking into it so I was like okay fine and then I, I went back to the U.S. and I could not find anybody that could even spell ayahuasca for three years all I did was Every day I would meditate for almost an hour and just give my thanks and my gratitude to the spirit of ayahuasca. And just, I would feel the energy flowing back through me. And when the time was right to be connected to whoever and whatever would, would serve me. Uh, incidentally, when I got back, I brought a little piece of ayahuasca and my wife, who's super sensitive psychic wise, she started having visions. I mean, she was in this mesh in, in, the, in the woods and these roots and I mean, she was not drinking, touching anything. It was just like this energy had from the jungle had kind of been dripping off of me. So it was hugely, hugely powerful. And um, yeah, three years. And then I finally connected with a group in California and started um, attending ceremony out there. And that was, 
that was amazing. And I learned a lot. And then one day, three years later, and I never tried to convince my wife. I never like, this was my own mission and she respected it. And you know, there was never, Oh honey, you should like none of that stuff. Um, and then three years later, she just one day said, I'm ready. And I was like, for lunch, you want to go like, what are you talking about? She goes, no, I'm ready to see what you see. And I was like, are you talking about ayahuasca? She said, yes. And I said, well, Hey, that's so fortunate because I just connected with these guys in California and let's go do that. And she was like, no, I'm like, I want to do it exactly like you did it. And I want to go to Peru and I want to, you know, work with that same thing and have that experience. And uh, at the time we were going through a pretty substantial financial difficulty and I had no idea how this was going to play out, but she goes, no, in six months we'll be there. And sure enough, one thing led to another, and six months later, we were able to go, and it was exactly in October, three years from the time I had been there. And uh, we went, and she drank. Oh, my goodness. She had also, I mean, she was literally speaking in their native language, singing songs. I mean, we like when we went back, there was a male and a female shaman, and the female was a, a Shipibo. That's one of the native things. And then we were in ceremony and she would be singing and stuff. And then suddenly there were these two women singing these Shipibo songs. And it, I just thought I was in some other world or whatever. And the main female shaman was in front of my wife as she was so in it that she was on this other world and just told her, sing with me. And, and Shipibo is a whole other language. It's not even like Spanish. It's a whole other deal. So she had this unbelievable experience. I mean, all kinds of things like, you know, soul surgery where she was opened up and, 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 and uh, the, the spirit of ayahuasca like actually pulled out the essence of her soul and cleaned it off and pulled like black gunk out of it. And then it became this beautiful, brilliant, shining, shining soul and put wow. it back inside of her and everything was, you know, put back and all kinds of dancing snakes uh, representing the ayahuasca. I mean, it was this unbelievable, she was just, she was totally all in. So anyway. And, and then uh, in Pentecostal religions, they call that speaking in tongues. Yes. Yeah. But it's, it's the, the power of Christ compels her. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's out there, you know, nobody's excluded. <laughs> well, anyway, that, that was obviously the big, Oh, aha moment, turning point, awareness of, you know, what was going on. Mm. So from that point on, she was all in and supportive. And then uh, came back to the United States and uh, the medicine clearly told me, take me with you. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, was that respectful? I, you know, I thought it was a jungle thing, whatever. And it was just like, take me with you. I was like, oh, okay. And so I was able to get a liter of this medicine and bring it back with me. And I was like, well, okay, what? And it was like, uh, how about you drink it? So for a year by myself, every other Saturday, I would by myself find out how much was too much, mm -hmm. how much was not enough. And I would drink by myself and let the medicine teach me what was going on. And I would listen to the songs called Icaros. And that's the, the traditional ceremonial songs that are sung. And there's all different kinds from all different places. And so... That's what I did. And then um, there was actually an anthropology student who had caught wind of that. And he's like, oh, man, can I check it out? And then about halfway through that process, he kind of became uh, my wingman. And so it ended up being the two of us. But, uh, yeah, it was just that's how I learned. It was just a year every other weekend of ayahuasca, like I said, finding out how much was too much and, right. and whatnot. And then uh, after that process, then other people started to become aware. And they were like, oh, I've heard, I've read, or, you know, is there any way – so I was like, yeah, well, like, yeah, okay. And then it would be two people and three and four. You so know? it's good that you became a minister of this and not like Fight Club or something like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, word, word's getting out way too fast. <laughs> exactly. But it just started growing. Okay. And, um, you know, and it got like really popular. People were achieving amazing results. And, uh, and I wasn't pretending to be anybody's shaman. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I just was told this is it and you need to do this and here and practice and do your thing. And then, uh, and then I went back to Peru and, and reconnected with uh, the shaman that I had worked with initially and said, hey, here's what's going on. I, you know, I gave him my story and, you know, and I've been learning lots of stuff. And he said, all right, well, 
let's you and me just drink and let's see what's going on. Show me what you got. And I was like, all right. And it was, it was really kind of funny because it was just him and I, and we were in the middle of the jungle in this teeny little shack in a downpour. And it was just, oh, it was crazy. And he poured a bunch, like mm. a, a bunch of ayahuasca <laughs> for him and for me, right? And it takes a little while for it to kick in. And so after, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, I wasn't feeling anything at all. And he's like, all right, go. And I'm like not feeling anything. And usually a big part of the ceremony uh, for a facilitator who's, who's doing whatever they're doing is that you, like, you learn songs and you learn musical instruments and you learn all that to be able to be a better instrument for the medicine itself as the medicine wants to express whatever it's going to express. So, you know, when you're singing, it's not just Clay singing a song. It's like, I am able to sing this song, which calls certain plant energies as ayahuasca is kind of using me as this sort of tool and instrument. So, um, the medicine had not kicked in. I'm sitting there in front of this guy who I learned all his songs. And here I am stone cold sober without kind of my connection to the, the inner energies. And I just went through singing his songs and it just, I felt like I was a complete failure and I was embarrassed and ashamed and all this other kind of stuff. Like, man, I could have done better. He's like, okay, good. That was fine. Have a seat. After I sang for, I don't know, an hour or something, 45 minutes. And, uh, and then he got up and then he re-sang each song back to me that were his original songs. And from the minute he opened his mouth on the first song, the medicine immediately kicked in and I was back in that hole roof blew off the place. And you know, the medicine is talking to me. I mean, it was, it was like a light switch got flicked on and off. So I don't think it was an accident that it wasn't in place when I was doing my thing. So he could just kind of see my, my normal thinky self. You know, mm. and uh, and he went and sang every every everyone back. He said, "Here, this is what I'm doing." And he and then after every song, it's like he 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 injected it back into my the fabric of my being. He's like, "Okay, you did good on a brain level of learning it, but here's the essence and the energy of it." And, whoa, and, and gave it back to me. So, so that was my my my, my introduction to the, how to dispense this energy that I had been practicing. And then after that, he said, okay, come back and, you know, stay with me for an extended period of time. And I'll go through some intense one-on-one -on -one training with you in order to, to prepare you for, for holding ceremonies. And so I did that for uh, almost a month or three weeks. And um, then after that, I was, a, I was facilitating ceremonies. I mean, the, the path to shamanism is a huge thing. He's been doing it 45 years, three generations. I mean, that's not my thing. Um, that's what I'm, I'm working on and I'm, I'm on the path, but I'm strictly a facilitator making a safe space with safe medicine for people to be able to have their spiritual experience because it's the direct experience between the medicine and the person that, that that's what this is all about. Do you ever get a situation where like I've experienced this where you've just eaten a brownie, an edible brownie, a marijuana brownie, and it just, it, it hits your brain so hard and people get paranoid, they get anxious, they can't breathe all of a sudden. Does ayahuasca have that similar quality? And if so, how, like, do you have people who have like a, what we would call a bad trip or a bad experience? Ayahuasca is enormously different than marijuana. I mean, the whole spirit of the plant, the whole, you know, chemical reaction of what's going on. So there is a very hugely different experience. Um, also, unlike marijuana, a huge part of the ayahuasca experience is preparation with intention. Like there's a whole week long preparation before uh, with your diet and with your, your whole mentality and your exposure to drama and, 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 really focusing on the things that you are looking to receive answers on in your life. So that's generally not the practice as somebody gobbles a brownie down, <laughs> you know, and as far like set and setting also make a huge difference too. So combined with probably the lack of the week of preparation of cleansing, as mm -hmm. well as the focus 
on your intentions of why you're doing it and the great possibility that you've just down this brownie in a random location right all that really adds up and stacks to what could be the bad trip you were referring to yep. whereas as a facilitator what i feel hugely responsible for is setting the energy mm -hmm. of the space i mean doing you know the whole spiritual protection thing making sure the environment is conducive to a beautiful and calming experience a very mellow uptake as you're going into it and it takes a while and then holding the energy i mean that's what all the songs are about i mean you're the songs do a variety of helping you purge. They do, uh, you know, they can help you project further out into these other dimensions. Uh, there's joy, there's love, there's, you know, spiritual cleansing. I mean, it's not just like, here you go, bro, you're on your own, which where like a brownie, like I said, there's a whole preparation set and setting. And then what do you do? And then you start, you know, I mean, that's, that's not what's going on here. This is a very, very guided, very safe, very comfortable type deal. And, yeah, certainly it happens where people kind of get more than they originally had bargained for and there is some overwhelm going on. Sure. But there is also, um, th there are a variety of things that, that we are trained to do as facilitators to help calm the energies, to help guide the people back, to, to remind them this is not a permanent thing and everything, it happens a lot like in waves. So no matter how wonderful or how challenging it may be, everything is passing. So generally with all of that going on and, and with the things we can do to be able to help calm the folks, the anxiety, bad trip thing, generally, you know, we've had people that have had their moments, mm -hmm. but just never ah, bad trip. And then right. kind of a thing. I think it's that people just don't know how to control their mind. Well, and that is one of the things that we talk about going into the ceremonies is the beauty of ayahuasca is that it really lets you experience and fully flow with the energy of your soul, which is a hundred million times bigger than the brain. And that's kind of the beauty of it is that it lets you step out of that little teeny box called thinking and to see the big picture. So we tell people ahead of time, don't try to interpret everything. Don't try to understand it. And surrender is the way to go. You breathe, you surrender, and everything that comes to you is for your benefit. You know, and if you try with your brain, it's like being in a moving car, hanging out the window, trying to hold on to a railing somewhere because you're like, no, no, no. You know, you're gonna that's gonna cause a problem. It's either gonna pull you out of the car, you know, you're something. But if you just kind of let go, everything flows and you're not going to have these big resistance issues, which I believe are the foundation of a lot of, you know, suboptimal experiences that people have. And so you begin facilitating this here for, and how, how, how does that, how you transition from your training there to, you know, establishing a more formal ceremony here for people? Um, well, yeah, like I said, after doing that training and then continually striving just to be more proficient in, in the tools that I can offer ayahuasca to be able to utilize as I'm facilitating. Mm -hmm. um, and I said the groups were growing and growing. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, I realized, so we need to kind of get as official as possible. Yeah. So we incorporated as a church in 2017 okay. with the state of Arizona, you know, religious nonprofit organization. Uh, so we're in with the state. We were completely open. We had Facebook. We had a web page that described every aspect of what was going on. You know, we were as open, no hiding, no nothing as possible. And so that's kind of how we started it as far as let's make this a little more, you know, official, clean cut type. Yeah. Thing. But then, also, you know, educating again people that may not have any experience or insight as well you know anybody can just now get on the internet and have a little bit more of an idea of what this is and what's available in their community so right and, and also like hey to, to do a little bit of 
of homework on, on your own just to kind of see. Yeah, precisely. But, but that's kind of a double-edged sword too, because God knows what's out on the internet and, you know, people want eyeballs. So, <laughs> you know, having somebody just sit there and go, oh, wow, I just realized that I was the source of the things that were the issues in my life. And now that I've seen them clearly, I've been able to make my own choice and things are great. Mm -hmm. That doesn't pull in the views like somebody going, Whoa, oh my God, I was in this ceremony. You know what I mean? Like, so there's some funky stuff out there as far as videos on, you know, on ayahuasca because oh, yeah. they want the drama. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I can say in our years of holding ceremony, we had minimal drama. I mean, really minimal and looking on the internet you would think that it's a crapshoot 50 50 chance that you know <laughs> people are going to be screaming and speaking in tongues and you know all kinds of all hell's going to break loose but that yeah. that was not the case no yeah not the case yeah. i think i would i think i would be trying to start the party though i feel like i'd be dancing and singing you know what i mean and there's a lot of that yes <laughs> maybe it's good that we haven't gotten him involved yet <laughs> so <laughs> So I guess this uh, this this is leading up to the climax, and, and I think it's it's the resentment and resistance to the comparison. You're, I think ayahuasca is not a drug, correct? And we are thinking of the, in the in the thinking the the box, the construct that people are thinking the the court system, the religious systems, the, everything has to fit neatly into this box. This is how you properly pray to God. This is. This is how you should just escape, maybe have a drink, have a martini after work, and that's it. And that's the norm. You're doing something different that people relate to. They're trying to compare it. I asked about the weed brownie, right? And Not a fair comparison, right? People might say, okay, well, what's the difference between LSD and ayahuasca? What's the difference between mushrooms and ayahuasca? And people are still going to classify this as a drug? Ayahuasca? At least the DEA, right? And so I think when you get into law... We're asking for a religious exemption, but we're not critically looking at the law and saying maybe the law is doing something wrong. Maybe it's the law that is incorrect. And it's like, what is it? Why is the law preventing this from happening? Well, I mean, that's kind of the, the foundation of uh, like our whole federal case. Um, uh, there was a church and their case went to the, the Supreme Court. Mm hmm. And uh, the Supreme Court did rule in favor of the church. And part of that ruling is that the DEA uh, was mandated to set up some form of something so that religious organizations that were using a variety of plant medicines for sacraments could apply for an exemption from the Controlled Substances Act. And that sounds like a really awesome, reasonable thing. Right. It was the Ocentro decision, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, so the DEA did do something. However, the something turns out it's a two-step deal. And the first thing is uh, to apply. You need to completely lay out all information about your church, everything, who, what, when, how many people, what are you doing, what is your sacrament, where does, you know what I mean? Like it's the whole nine yards and then you sign it. Okay. Well, that translates to a confession of schedule one narcotic distribution, which is not really great, especially when you're handing it to the DEA. Right. So you can see there's a little, you know, hesitancy for that, but it, people have submitted. And then the second requirement is that you cease and desist from all of your church activities until you are approved. Okay. And that kind of could sound reasonable. You know, I mean, this thing, like if you just were over coffee saying, oh, you, we just submit it and then you have to wait to get approved and then they do this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it were a 30 or 90 day process, that kind of, you know, eh, maybe. Well, so that was, I believe, 2006 and it's 2021. So yeah. And how many have been approved since then? Are you familiar with the term goose egg? <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it is just an inherently flawed ordeal. Okay. Gotcha. And For people who don't know what a goose egg is, it's, love. <laughs> that would be zero. <laughs> that would be zero. And the only two churches that are operating with any degree of, of legality um, both sued the DEA in federal court. Mm -hmm. And uh, both decisions were in favor of the church. Mm. And so they have 
been told they need to work it out with the DEA. And so they have accounting and checking and, you know, they've worked it out with the right. DEA because of the court uh, decision. But as far as like anything goes for the rest of us, it is pretty much a setup. And there is no, there's no one office. There's no one person. There is no accountability. And there is no one that can give you a clue about how any of this works. They kind of sort of go into this whatever, and you don't know anything about what's going on. Meanwhile, you've reeled everything about your operation and you promised to stop. And if you don't, I think it's perjury or, I mean, it's a, it's not a good thing, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 So what we did was, um, we formed the, uh, North American association of visionary churches, the, the NAABC, which is not a church. Mm. It is a, an organization that represents these visionary churches. And then, so that way, when that organization communicates with the DEA, it's not a church. Mm -hmm. It is strictly, you know, a non-church entity. So in January, our attorney sent a letter to the DEA saying, hey guys, um, so, you know, we're the NAABC and we've, uh, you know, been through all of your materials of, of how, to, how to process this, re this request. And, and we went through and began and really were trying in earnest to put together this this um, this request uh, for an exemption from the Controlled Substances Act. But looking at it deeply, we believe that it is not a good thing, okay? And the only two churches that are operating have sued the DEA. And basically, we would like to know exactly who to contact, how long it's going to take, and, you know, like... Some sort of policy or this, procedure. Yeah, yeah, something, you know. And if, if we don't hear back then we're going to be forced to take legal action. And so that was, you know, whatever, early January. Um, at the same time, there was a, uh, a participant who signed up for, for one of our ceremonies. And uh, he was, uh, you know, gung-ho, like, woo -hoo, let's do it. And then... Um, there's always one. There's always one, <laughs> yeah. And like even three or four days before, he was like, I'm good, I'm in, we're all good. And then I guess something changed. I don't know the details, but then I got an email two and a half days before ceremony and like, no, like, no, no, can't make it, you know, and, uh, can I get a refund? And I was like, I was busy that day and I didn't respond to the email like right away. And up until that point, all the communication had been very cordial, you know, and it was, it was cool. Well, I didn't respond quickly enough. And it like, I don't even know, five fifty five or 6 AM the next morning I get, email and it's just, you know, refund or else. And I'm calling the authorities and, you know, it was this whole like big blow up thing. And I was like, wow, where did that come from? Cause last times people have a lot of nervousness right before a ceremony. And I was like, look, calm down. Here's your refund. This is not about being upset. And I had told him before, whatever we need to do to make your, you know, this experience beautiful because he was coming from California. You know, we, I told him we could change dates. We, you know, I mean, there had never been any weirdness going on anyway. So he went off, I refunded him and, um, that's all I heard, but he had said, Oh, you're, you're going to cops and all this stuff. Anyway, that was like the exact same time that our letter had gone to, to the DEA. So all this happened very interestingly, almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so we didn't hear anything. And we sent the letter to the DEA. So that was, you know, this is all early January, February, March, April. We had ceremony in May on my birthday on the 12th. And, uh, you know, we didn't hear anything. May 19th at 8.30 in the morning, we get this bam, 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 bam on the door. And my wife and I are still asleep. And uh, they said, open the door where we're going to knock it down. And I run in my underwear to open the door and it was the HIDTA, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Task Force, Eesh. which is a uh, DEA program and it's sponsored and funded by, by the DEA. And uh, often there are DEA agents that they utilize. However, because the whole drug sweep program is so large in the country, they don't have that many DEA agents, so they subcontract out. So this particular task force, the majority of which was the uh, County guys, Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. And there was one guy from uh, the Arizona Attorney General's office. Anyway, yeah, so they came storming in and. Would you, would you say they're jackbooted thugs? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I mean, look, I understand from their perspective. Coined by George H. Bush. They were, you know, guys doing their jobs. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. 
But um, yeah, I mean, it was like they pried open our, our security gate in the front and they had their big door bashing ram thing ready to go. They're going to break our door down. I'm assuming they had guns. Oh, yeah, they all had animals. Big, big automatic weapons. No animals. That's uh, nice. <laughs> now, this was during peak, too hot. peak COVID, right? Okay. May 19th. Were they wearing masks? Let me tell you. So we're elderly. We're okay. a couple. Yeah. Sheltering at home. I'm a veteran. I mean, we're like low profile thing. These guys show up with their weapons, ready to break the door down. They were wearing ball caps mm -hmm. and t-shirts. They had, now this is their cartel drug busting, top of the line drug SWAT laboratory busting team, right? Mm -hmm. You'd think maybe one might have a bulletproof vest. <laughs> they might have like a helmet, goggle. I mean, they knew they were knocking off an old couple. Okay. Right. It was 8.30 in the morning, probably after I had a chance to have some breakfast and a cup of coffee or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then our neighbor said they saw them, they all parked two blocks away and they were kind of whistling and like, we're going to go do a raid on the way. She's like, what's going on? These guys with guns in our neighborhood. Oh, mm -hmm. we're going to go do a search warrant and a raid. It was like, they were kind of like, this was like a, a thing for them. And then they came, they handcuffed me, took me out in the front yard. My wife was like, what's going on? Handcuffed her. Out in the front yard in her underwear. Yeah, that's not okay. I, you know, and and they they're wearing no masks at all, and they're in t-shirts, ball caps, and they're handling us. They're in our home, sheltering at home, and then finally, after a little while, they put the N95 masks on us mm. and said, "This is for your protection." <laughs> I'm like, "Isn't that backwards?" In my mask for you, and your mask for me, and this kind of stuff. So basically, you're putting these on in case we have it. You know, right. Anyway, so they read us our Miranda rights and asked, asked a bunch of questions, and I was I was trying to be cooperative as possible. Sure. And then they proceeded to go from one end to the other end of our house, tore it apart. Um, and uh, and you know I had uh, a licenses to grow uh, medical marijuana, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they said that they had smelled marijuana growing. I was like, whoa, hello, <laughs> yeah. Um, so they tore down my my uh, my marijuana grow confiscated uh, all the equipment and they confiscated the marijuana. And uh, then I had ayahuasca because we're an ayahuasca church. Mm -hmm. they confiscated all that and uh, left the house pretty much a wreck. Um, but they did not arrest us. And the guy said, well, I don't even know if they're going to press charges or not. And I'll talk to my boss and I'll say, you know, try to go easy. Cause I mean, we were an old couple and we didn't resist. And, you know, I mean, it's not like we were, big drug dealer thing. And uh, so that was a pretty traumatic event. Some people will call that robbery. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's legal robbery. There's a whole lot of different interpretations of what happened. <laughs> right. um, but anyway, we thought we were operating completely legally. I mean, you know, we were pretty open. We were transparent. Uh, yeah, we had, I mean, you're on social media, for God's sake. Right. right. I mean, we have testimonials of people whose lives have literally been saved uh, veterans who have been through every program at the VA, including all of their pharmaceutical stuff and their mental health and every, and nothing and still suicidal and achieved enormous success by working with ayahuasca. We've had uh, single parents mm. and I mean, in general, we had uh, bosses and recommended their employees and brothers and sisters and parents. I mean, it was this beautiful family healing thing. And we had been doing this work for a while. And it was just, I mean, it was growing because it was helping people. So, you know, we were had no idea there was anything illegal going on because we were referencing the court decisions mm -hmm. and we were wide open. We've been operating for years. No one had ever contacted us ever to say, hey, you know, uh, what you got going on there? Maybe we need to look into this. Right. And, and, and there are many ayahuasca churches in the country. And there was a huge one on the East Coast that produced a full length motion picture called uh, Shock and Awe about how ayahuasca helps PTSD veterans. Right. I mean, okay. And the DEA sent them a letter saying, hey, guys, you know, uh, we're aware of you and, um, you know, you might want to apply. I mean, that was it. And they're huge. And we got raided, you know, by seven guys with automatic weapons. You know, it was just like, what is going on here? Nobody's been, been raided for ayahuasca since, I don't even know, I think it was like 1990 nine or something. And then it, several years later, they finally took all this stuff to court. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it had been a while and it was very, very brutal, traumatic experience. Yeah. But, it sounds like it. Yeah. 
So they didn't. They, did they were they forceful? Did they push? Did they harm you? You know, to their credit, they were fairly respectful. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like on the floor is going back. You know, it was yeah, like yeah. you know, it wasn't like that. They were like, "Here, sir," and you know, the handcuffs too tight. And you know, I mean, they were not jerks about their interactions with us. Okay, uh, they were very professional. Okay, I mean, what happened overall, I think, was. No bueno. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but no, I, I don't have a problem with just how they conducted themselves. It was just the fact that it happened and what they did. And now how have things proceeded since then? I know that there's some, there's been some legal proceedings and stuff, the legal action that you've taken. So there's only so much that you could discuss. So it's. Yeah. Well, all this happened while we are waiting our day in federal court or the original suit with the DEA to mm-hmm. try to get our uh, DEA number. Like doctors have a DEA number, so they're authorized to dispense medication and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so that is our basic lawsuit with the DEA is like, hey, we just want our day in court because we have not been recognized and we want to be recognized and be able to, to legally work with ayahuasca because there is an issue with local law enforcement not understanding this whole, you know, First Amendment freedom of religion thing and that – if your religion encompasses some form of sacrament, that that actually is a legal process. And it's not looked at as the same as somebody who's, you know, driving around with some illegal substance in their car. You know what right. I mean? Like, like it is authorized for ceremonial religious use, you know, and I, there's mushrooms, there's ayahuasca, you know, there's a variety of, of longstanding uh, religious use of, Plant medicines. So, so that's why we applied with the DEA to begin with, because it's a very gray area. And though people achieve magnificent results with ayahuasca, that's always kind of this hidden secret, like, okay, and are they going to find out it's my employer? And you know, everyone's all, they're excited by it, but they're really worried about, you know, this whole legality thing. So we were like, man, we, this needs to come out of the shadows. We need to, to really completely get legal so we can tell people, here's our DEA number. Mm-hmm. And that's what the original suit was about. But then, you know, Six months later, five months, whatever, May 19th, all this stuff goes down. And uh, it was uh, it was pretty shocking. And then um, in September, uh, we were at a, a hearing where our attorney was trying to get, um, it's called a preliminary injunction, where basically it was just like an order of protection to not be attacked again by law enforcement. And we're waiting for our, our federal court date. Anyway, uh, so there were attorneys there from the state and the county and, you know, and the DEA and whatnot. And they were all like, these guys are under no threat of prosecution. Judge, you don't need to give them any kind of uh, protection against law enforcement. Because if you do, that's going to be a blanket protection, you know. And it's like, heaven knows if they commit any of these other crimes, we can't, you know, enforce it. And mm-hmm. and really, there, there's no worry. We're, we're all just waiting for this federal court date, you know. And so we didn't get granted this, this order of protection. And... Uh, and then it was about a year and we had not heard anything, no charges pressed. And, you know, we thought that's exactly what was going on is what they had said in that, in that hearing. So statue, that's 20, limi- statue of limitations. No, that's like, okay. if it applied, it'd be seven years. And I don't know what that is, but, I mean, but for anybody listening, it's now 2021, right? Yeah. So, so now it's 2021. And, uh, and then we take a church group annually down to Peru, the ones that, that this really speaks to so they can, they can, study deeper and, mm-hmm. and they can study with, with my teacher and he's third generation shaman and he's been doing this 45 years and his father and grandfather. And, you know, it's like, like if you received benefit here in the United States through our ceremony, mm-hmm. that's kind of the tip of the iceberg to actually being in the jungle and harvesting these plants yourself and making this, this brew and really spiritually connecting in the home of these plants. So there's people, a lot of people are eager to like go to the source. So yeah. every year we, we take a group down, it's, you know, and, uh, and the dates were, were publicly known when we were taking this next group down, it was going to be the end of August. And, uh, and when we checked the uh, search warrant database and there was no warrant for my arrest, cause it's been a year and we're like, I don't know, there's something going on. Yeah, that's what's going on. And, um, and I even, uh, had booked a flight to Amsterdam that it was, that was refundable Mm -hmm. just to see if anything came up you're like, Oh no, you know, sorry, sir. You can't No, it was totally fine. So, so we did all the checking we could to see if there was any issue with this because it had been a while 
And actually, I, I had uh, left the country twice because I have uh, lymphoma. I have uh, grade three lymphoma. And uh, so my wife and I went back to the jungle in, in November to go be with my teacher for a month uh, to do cancer work, you know, kind of like the whole jungle side of this. And um, then we went to Costa Rica in March for a month to a cancer healing retreat, which was kind of like this hardcore health boot camp thing where it was mm -hmm. like change your life and change your diet and all that kind of stuff. So, so we had been out of the country and returned twice since then, and there was no issue. So, you know, I were like, okay. So we do this this trip, and generally I I go three days ahead of time uh, uh, ahead of the group in order to go like coordinate the hotel and everybody and whatnot. And uh, coordinator. Facilitator, <laughs> minister. So I fly from here to Los Angeles, no problem. I'm in Los Angeles and I'm waiting to board my flight to Peru. And they called my name right before the, the boarding. I was like, oh, okay, seat change. Yeah, upgrade. Upgrade, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, she goes, are you Mr. Villanueva? I was like, oh, yeah. She goes, uh, he would like to speak with you. And there's a Homeland Security guy right there. And I'm like, interesting. It's like, are you... And I was like, uh, yes, I am. He goes, can I see your driver's license? Real family, like, yeah, sure, here you go. Driver's license out. Next thing you know, it was handcuffs. Jeez. I'm like, what is going on here? Anyway, so we did a bunch of in-processing with the Homeland Security, and they went through all my luggage and my suitcase and everything in my wallet and all that. And they said, well, there's a warrant for your arrest. I'm like, what are you talking about? I had no idea. And uh, they said, well, we're calling the uh, LAPD, and then they will verify. And LAPD came, and then they called back to Phoenix, and Phoenix was like, oh, yes, absolutely, we, we want him. So arrest him and detain him. Hmm. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I was uh, held by the LAPD for, I don't even know, day and a half, day? So I can't remember. It, it went on forever. And then I was moved to uh, Los Angeles, um, L.A. County, and then that intake process took almost two days, and that was the most bizarre experience I've ever had in my life, uh, like freezing to death. And uh, it was just, you know, many, many, many of us in uh, in cells and just, you know, just trash on the floor and sleeping on the floor. It was just, it was, it was amazing. Um, anyway, and then finally got taken in there, and I uh, got my own rack in the uh, in the old guys. Uh, jail and I was there for about 10 days and then uh, Phoenix came to get me um, to extra so I was extradited back to Phoenix and uh, taken into the Maricopa County um, system and that was another lengthy intake process and I had a hearing at 2 30 a.m. and uh, the bail was like astronomical um, way more than anybody could ever come up with and so I was stuck and, uh, yeah, I was, uh, incarcerated for a total of, I don't know, like 34 days. And, uh, because of my cancer and my, my weak state and compromised immune system, I spent the last eight days of that in the hospital. I was rushed by ambulance, mm. basically from hypothermia, freezing to death, yeah. starvation, and then, uh, basically food poisoning because everything in there is pure salt or sugar or packaged and stuff. And I had been for five months on this cancer diet, which was all organic, you know, food and like supplements and green coffee enemas. And like, I mean, everything you can imagine in the prison system, the good stuff, the opposite. Yeah. So, yeah. And then finally, um, after almost dying, the court was persuaded to modify my release conditions slightly. So, uh, so I could put my house as collateral, and then they were able, I was able to uh, to be released. I have I wear an ankle monitor, and I'm subject to drug testing and have to call in like every day. That's eminent domain. They took your house essentially. Well, they attempted, um, and that's all kind of on hold, and so we don't know what's going on with that. But yeah, we could we could definitely uh, lose our house. Take a man's property, his dignity. Were you treated with dignity through this whole process? being detained huh. um i don't know if that's the word i would describe, use I mean, to I describe mean, <laughs> you if, if you have, have health issues and i always found in my experience with law enforcement that you were just 
nobody took you serious. They just kind of rolled their eyes at you, didn't really care what your story was, just kind of assumed you were guilty and treated you um, with a lack of discern. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was, you know, I mean, medically, uh, the people like the nurse and the doctor that was at the facility, I could have a pretty decent conversation with, you know, sure. but their whole conversation was, we're, our, our hands are tied. I mean, there's nothing we can do. Yes, we see what's going on. And yes, we know whatever is being called food here has nothing to do with anything that, that you were doing. And uh, I mean, it, it was ridiculous. It was like, I mean, guy, like there's like the food to begin with was barely able to even be called food. And there was a tiny amount. I mean, guys were like starving. I mean, it was just, it was the most bizarre experience and yet, like you said, you're always treated like you're guilty and suspicious of everything, you know? I mean, it was a pretty drastic change. I've never been treated ever like that in my life. So, yeah, it was it was the institution and their policies that I found shocking, shocking, and almost to my undoing as a human being. Thank you. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So right now there is a case ongoing. I don't even know how much I'm at liberty to discuss on all, you know, any topics there. So understandable. Gonna, yeah. I'm going to. Should I'm be gonna, public record someday and people should. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. At, at some point, you know, until, but until then. Yeah. Whether I, you know, do you think you'll go to the Supreme court? I know last time it was eight, nothing, but Samuel Alito sat that one out. <laughs> that was in 2006. You know, I, I don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. I mean, I was just so glad to not have died in jail because I was on my way. And I, at several points, actually thought, well, this is it, you know? And I just made my my total peace with everything and just released all attachment to anything in the material world. And I, I felt this unbelievably beautiful sense of freedom. And I was, I was ready to go. I mean, I was like, okay, so this is how it's going to end. Certainly nothing I would have imagined, but hey, you know, the universe is a pretty creative place. And if I'm going to go in a holding cell with my head against the toilet and next to the guy next to me withdrawing from heroin, I, hey, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know who wrote the script, but that was, that was pretty darn interesting. Um, but it didn't turn out exactly that way. But I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, if I have to return to incarceration, it'll be the end of me physically as a human being. So that's a... Interesting prospect. So yeah, let's hope that's not the outcome. And um, I wanted to just ask, what is there anything that you would want anybody listening to take away from just this entire conversation? If there was there's one big big thing that you'd want everybody to kind of take away from this, obviously, besides don't go to don't get arrested and go to jail. That's, <laughs> yeah, I think, that's wonderful advice. Yeah, yeah. right. That, that, I think that that's obvious. Right? Don't do anything felonious. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, to anybody listening that's interested in the ayahuasca experience, no one that I know has been arrested as a participant. Okay. Ever. So that's not to worry about. Right. Uh, drug testing. No one tests for DMT. They're yeah. all testing for, you know, meth, cocaine, heroin, you know, the, the, the big hitters out there that everyone's, mm -hmm. you know, so if you're worried about any testing with your job, no one that I know has ever had any issue with it, with a drug test, mm -hmm. with ayahuasca and no participant in a ceremony has ever been arrested or had a legal problem with that. So I would say, put your mind at ease. This, is, <clears throat> this was more from like an organizational facilitation kind of a thing to be able to be completely legal and to show local law enforcement, the guys mm -hmm. who came after me, yeah. I could be like, wait a minute, I have this little card here from the DEA. Yeah. It says, we're authorized, can you please holster your weapon and put the handcuffs away because we've kind of worked all this out ahead of time. Right. You know what I mean? Like That's what was going on with this whole thing. And that's why we did in the first place because of what did end up happening to me. And I believed I was operating com completely legal, mm -hmm. illegally. So these charges that you know have been brought up, I do not believe at all have the relevance that law enforcement feels because their perspective is that we're just a sham organization in order to disguise narcotic drug distribution. Yeah. Which is not at all what's happening. So. Yeah. If anybody was interested in 
either either contributing or donating anything to your assistance in all this is is, is I imagine legal fees are extraordinary for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was going to say yeah, I, I and didn't you, even think you of took that. Took your home? Yeah, so is there something that anybody listening can actively do? Certainly um at nabc.org uh there is a, a contribution capability there. N A A V C. Yeah. Okay. North American like Association VCR, of VCR. That should be easy for you to remember. N double A V C. N double A V C R. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't win with this guy. <laughs> I didn't bring it up. So but that's gonna be lodged in people's minds and they'll get confused. Right. <laughs> so N double A V C period. The North American Association of Visionary Churches. Visionary Churches. Yeah. Well, thank you. So yeah. Anything obviously would be greatly appreciated because the legal fees are crushing to say the least. I yeah, one can imagine. And so ideally as a result of this suit, then you'll be the the third third church, Ayahuasca Church now? Or? Well, the suit is not with my church. It's with the NAABC. Yes. Okay. So that's a third party. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. However, it looks like the federal decision is going to take a while. Oh, I can and imagine. the state one is now proceeding full gun. So I don't know exactly what that means, but it looks like there's going to need to be some sort of outcome at the state level before the federal level now. Whereas initially, the whole idea was that everybody's waiting for the federal. Yeah. To find out if what we were doing was fully legal in the first place. Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of the cart before the horse thing. And I don't even know what that means, but it's certainly not what we were looking for. And I don't know how, what the outcome of that's going to be. Yeah. Just going to wait and see, right? Religious exemptions and who decides what the religion is and what's acceptable conduct for a religion to engage in. Exactly. And, and that's one of the big questions in all this, especially with the NAABC, is like, who gave the DEA the right to decide on your validity as a religion? Like, really? They're in the drug biz. I mean, <laughs> like, like, really, you're going to decide on if you're a church or not? I mean, and no one ever bestowed them that authority. So, yeah, it's a wild and woolly <laughs> situation. Yeah, I don't know if the DEA is the first uh, organization that comes to mind when I think about that, but I know they can be underfunded, and that's how we would get rid of them. Uh, I guess in other word, defund them. I guess maybe is what. Well, it already sounds like they're <laughs> underfunded because nobody's doing any paperwork or anything. But that conversation <laughs> around defunding any law enforcement agency is is a is a fine line to walk, you know, because it's is. We do love our blue and yeah, there's a lot of funk going on that we all would like to be protected from. So, you know, not having anybody is a suboptimal situation. Mm -hmm. However, when things get kind of out of control and there's no, you know, monitoring of what's going on, you know, power corrupt and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You know, so there's that, what's, you know, do you want protection? And when does it kind of cross the line into, huh, yo, Tony, you want protection? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's, there's a lot going on out there. And there's going to continue to be, right? I think this is an ongoing conversation. Correct. I, I think I, I started tonight really on the religious side of things and I didn't take a step back to actually learn about what I've also come to know as mother ayahuasca. And I think that's the important part of this conversation is there's something that exists that is helping people and people are not getting access to it. And exactly. And I mean, that's what I quite literally am willing to die for. I mean, that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I mean, depending upon the outcome of this, if they're like, whatever happens, no matter what, this man needs to go to prison. I love you guys. I'm out. I mean, that's the, you know, but I have to tell you, I could not have lived a more proud existence knowing that there are people alive today and families with parents that wouldn't have if they had not had access to this medicine. And I know we've served many hundreds of people. So, you know, if I go, I know that I did something substantial here. 
you've definitely impacted people. And I hope our listeners, they can't, they can't see you, but you're, you're demonstrating some emotion right now and it's beautiful. And I, I, I appreciate your willingness to come out and share your story and share the message. Is yeah. there, yeah. Is there anything else you want to share for the world? I would love to hold ceremony for the DEA and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department and the Arizona Attorney General. I shit you not. This is like the real deal. I mean, like there's just no comprehension. They're in a box and the whole nature of ayahuasca is about the freedom of not being in a box. Mm. And they're the official badge and gun toting. This box is the real deal. Yeah. I would, I would be honored to hold ceremony for any single person in law enforcement. And we've had a number of law enforcement people come through our ceremonies. You know, obviously nobody would say what's going on. You know, <laughs> names have been withheld to protect the innocent <laughs> right, right. stuff, right? Yeah, we've had law enforcement, you know, firefighters. We've had, you know, uh, frontline, tons of nurses. I mean, like, of the people who've experienced ayahuasca, like, if you could ever really get a for real list of them, you'd be like, no way. Mm. Yeah. Let's go add our name to the list. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, they educated two more people today at least. So, uh, Clay, I appreciate you coming on and anybody that has, uh, any more questions or cares to engage with us, they can again, find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, by searching for the catch the sky podcast or wherever you listen to podcasts and be sure to subscribe. You just never know what to come to expect on the catch the sky podcast. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so new episodes every Friday at 6, and until next week, keep trying to catch the sky. Catch the sky.